congregation and no stranger to a lot of us here. Uh, Randall has been preaching full time for the last over the last 30 years. He has preached in Texas and Oklahoma. He currently preaches for the Robertson Road congregation in Grand Prairie. He has been serving the tech congregation for 17 years. He is past director of the Maybank School of Bible Studies. He has previously taught at the Black Mesa Youth Bible Camp in Oklahoma for over 10 years. Currently is in his ninth year as an instructor at Brown Trail School of Preaching. He has preached at lectureships, gospel meetings in Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. He is also a frequent guest speaker in Dallas-Fort Worth area Wednesday night lectureships. He's the father of a school teacher, a banker, and a soldier. His family also includes a son-in-law and a daughter-in-law. And without any further comment, we now welcome Randall Morris up here to speak to us. My daughter is with me here this evening, and I appreciate her so much. She loves the Lord very much and is constantly encouraging others and studying with people that she knows at school and is a very faithful Christian woman and one of the joys and delights of my life. And I appreciate her so much and love her dearly and appreciate her making her way here with me, accompany me here at this time to be with you. In the introduction, it said that I was the father of a school teacher. She's the school teacher, and a very good one, and uh, very well respected by her peers. And also the father of a banker. Uh, I always thought that my son would be in banking since he was about 15 years old. I just figured he'd be robbing one instead of actually working in one. But um, had my challenges with him, but he texted me about two months ago, and he said, Dad, he said, exactly 10 years ago today I graduated high school. And I texted him back and said, Son, I'm so proud of what you've done with your life in the last 10 years, and I, I meant that sincerely. My soldier son is about to be deployed in November to Afghanistan. So if you happen to think about Stephen, you might want to pray for him and for his wife, his new wife, as they are separated, and he defends our country. But I am very, very proud of my children and very thankful and grateful that God has blessed me with children whom I believe love the Lord and want to do what's right in his sight. I'm blessed tonight to be able to uh, speak to you on a subject that is very near and dear to my heart because I love the book of Habakkuk. When Ken called me and asked me what I would want to do as far as the minor prophets are concerned, I wanted to do the minor prophet Habakkuk. And so we have this opportunity to be here, and it's about 20 after, and I'm supposed to be through by 8 o'clock, and I've got about two hours worth of material that I need to get through. So what we're going to do is I'm going to fast forward talks faster than I usually do and see if we can't get it all done in a short period of time. Habakkuk 1 and verse 1 says the burden which Habakkuk the prophet saw. Some translations, the newer ones say the oracle. But Jerome in his commentary said burden is never placed in the title except when the vision is heavy and full of burden and toil. Sometimes we don't think about gospel preaching and being a servant of God and his kingdom as burdensome. Our brother mentioned in his prayer just a few minutes ago, Ephesians 3 and verse 8. 
that the Apostle Paul said, I am the least of the saints. But by the grace of God, I've been granted the opportunity to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. And I would never undermine that thought. In 1 Corinthians 9, 16, the Apostle Paul said, I am under obligation. God forbid if I preach not the gospel. I would never undermine that thought. The unsearchable riches of Christ is something that is, was mentioned a few minutes ago. It's something that I've been blessed to do full-time for 30 years, and I was about 19, I think that it was, and Ken and I are just about the same age. I think I might be a couple of months older than him. We preached our first sermons together at the old Broadway building back in 1973, 74, somewhere in there, and uh, have been going strong ever since, and I know that Ken's been a great blessing to this congregation now serving as one of its elders, and that's a great accomplishment, a great compliment to him. And I certainly appreciate his friendship and kinship. And uh, so many of you I've known for so many years, since back in the 70s, and I appreciate y'all being here tonight. But there are times when preaching is not fun. There are times when preaching can be a burden. In Jeremiah chapter 15, 17, the, apostle, or rather the prophet Jeremiah said, I did not sit in the company of the merrymakers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone. Because of your hand was upon me, I was indignant. Sometimes we're called upon as preachers to perform tasks or do things that are unpleasant. In Philippians 3 and verse 18, the apostle Paul said the following, I've told you before and I tell you now, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is their shame, whose mind, who mind earthly things, whose end is destruction. It is not a pleasant task to sit down across the table from somebody and tell them that they're on their way to hell, that they are in a mode of destruction, that their lifestyle is going to have to change. Sometimes people are receptive, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they want to hear it, sometimes they don't. Jesus said, the world hates me because I testify concerning it that its deeds are evil, John 7 and verse 7. So when Habakkuk introduces, or when the Holy Spirit introduces Habakkuk's message, calling it the burden of Habakkuk, we can see there are three at least, and there are more, but we're just going to look at three to begin with, things that are burdening Habakkuk. The first is in Habakkuk chapter 1, uh, verses 2 through 4. It says, How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and you will not hear? I cry to you violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored. One translation says it is paralyzed. Another translation says that it is powerless. That doesn't sound right with the scriptures, does it? Isaiah 55 and verse 11 says, My word shall not return to be void without accomplishing that for which I sent it forth. And yet we see here where Habakkuk says the law is powerless, that it is paralyzed, that it is ignored, and that is true. God's word will accomplish what it has been sent forth to do. It will do one of two things. It will save you or it will condemn you. God's word is going to do what he sent it forth to do. But the effect of God's word on a congregation, the effect of God's word upon his people can be negated or made negligible by their willingness to ignore, their choice to paralyze it. Here is Habakkuk and he's got a burden. He said, I see wickedness, I see violence, I see iniquity. And I don't see God doing anything about it right now. He said, why are you allowing me to see these things and not anything be done about them? The law is paralyzed. People are not listening to the law. The law is ignored. People are doing what's right in their own eyes, as we read in Judges 21, because there was no king in Israel. And so the burden of Habakkuk is to be a sincere and genuine prophet of God. A man who has in his heart and mind the desire to see God's word fulfilled. To see it lived out in people's lives. And yet what he sees is just the opposite. And he cries out violence and no one is paying attention 
and God does not seem to be acting. And so God speaks up in verse 5. Look among the nations, observe, and be astonished and wonder. Because I'm doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told. You, yeah, for behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people, who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. They are dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and keener than the wolves in the evening. Their horsemen come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swooping down to devour. All of them come for violence. Their horde of their faces moves forward. They collect captive, captives like sand. God said, I'm about to do something. I'm about to act. I'm acting on behalf of my people. I'm acting on behalf of myself. You see, he's going to bring the nation of Judea, he's going to bring Jerusalem into Babylonian captivity. In Ezekiel 24, he, going, he tells them, I'm, I'm about to destroy the delight of your eyes. The temple is going to be burned to the ground. The king's house is burned to the ground because of their idolatry. But now here's the second of Habakkuk's burdens. Because Habakkuk 1.13, having heard what God is about to do, says the following... He says, your eyes are too pure to behold what is evil. You cannot look upon wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? You see, one of the things Habakkuk, and, and by the way, we can just fast forward right quick to chapter 2 and verse 1. Because Habakkuk says, is it, this is another one of his burdens, 2 and verse 1. I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart and I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. You see, Habakkuk has the burden of seeing sin, violence, wickedness, and nothing much being done about it. But now God speaks up and says, I'm about to do something you won't believe even if I tell you I'm going to bring the Chaldeans, I'm going to bring the Babylonians, I'm bringing Nebuchadnezzar. And he is going to level Jerusalem. And he is going to bring the Israelites into 70 years of Babylonian captivity. And now Habakkuk said, now wait a minute. They're less righteous than the Judeans. And now you're going to subject Judea to those more, less righteous than they are? And so now his third burden is, of course, he is expecting to be reproved by God. Sometimes we don't think that God likes our questions. Sometimes we think that God doesn't want to hear us ask Him questions about what's going on. But one of the things we learn from the book of Habakkuk and a lesson we can take away from here is that God does not like, does not mind being questioned. God does not mind and understands us as human beings having the responsibility of saying, you know what, things don't look right. We read in Revelation chapter 6 as the seven sealed message is being revealed that they said, How long, O Lord, will you not avenge our death? When it was asked by saints in Revelation 6, it was answered. When it was asked by doubters in 2 Peter chapter 3, where is the promise of his coming for since the beginning of time, uh, all things have continued as they always have, and that was then the question of those who are willfully ignorant. There are times, brethren, when we want to know what's going on. We want to have answers to our questions. Habakkuk receives the answers to his questions, and then in chapter 3 we have his fourth, his fourth burden. Because in Habakkuk 3 and verse 1, it says, A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shinagoth. And I probably butchered that. I tried to pronounce it and practice it, but anyway... Lord, I've heard the report about you, and I fear. One translation said, I am afraid. He goes on to say, O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. You see, sometimes when we get the answer to our questions, it should make us afraid. You remember good King Josiah had initiated reforms that included rebuilding the temple, refurbishing it, making it as beautiful and magnificent as it once had been. 
And then all of a sudden, one of his uh, lieutenants comes to him and says, we found the book of the law of God in the temple. Apparently it had been lost. And when they started reading from the book of the law, he wept, he humbled himself, he tore his clothes. He said, God is very angry with us. Because he began to realize they were not worshiping God in spirit and truth. They weren't worshiping him, especially in reference to the Passover in the way that they should. I think sometimes people are ignorant of the Bible because they don't want to know what the Bible has to say. I think they don't want to listen to God because they don't want to hear what God has to say. And so Habakkuk, not, not, not in that disrespectful mode, but says, I've heard the report of you, now I'm afraid. In wrath, remember mercy. I was at Summer Youth Series last night at the Louisville Congregation. And Reed, the, uh, Swindle, who's the uh, youth man there at that congregation, was talking about the sinner's prayer and did an excellent job of explaining how we don't rely on the sinner's prayer for our salvation, but he did reference Luke 18. Luke 18, verses 8 through 10, in which the, the publican was unwilling even to lift up his eyes into heaven, but he said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He said, sometimes, sometimes that's all I can pray, and I understood that. That sometimes the only thing we can do is just cry out in agony because we know that God should be so angry with us and so upset with us and so heartbroken because of our sins that we're not even willing to look Him in the face. All we can do is say, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And that's what Habakkuk is saying. You see, Habakkuk knows... In chapter 2, there are five woes. Five woes of chapter 2. Habakkuk 2 and verse 5. It says, Woe to him, I'm sorry, verse 6 rather. It says, Woe to him who increases what is not his. How long? And to him who loads himself with many pledges. The New American Standard Translation says, Makes himself rich with loans. And then we go on to verse 7 and 8, and it says, Will not your creditors rise up suddenly, and those who collect from you awaken? Indeed, you will, be, you will become plunder for them, because you've looted many nations. All the remainder of the peoples will loot you because of human bloodshed and violence done to their land. Now, in part of that woe, he is pronouncing against Babylon. But it's also a woe against materialism. As a matter of fact, in Habakkuk 2 and verse 9, a second woe that is related to the first one that we mentioned in verse 6. Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house. We see that materialism and covetousness are pronounced a woe upon them. The person who covets evil gain for his house, who wants what somebody else has, that is pronounced a woe against. You see, we live in a culture and a time and society that believes that money answers everything. That's from Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 19. 400 years before these words that were spoken by Habakkuk, Solomon had said in his quest for truth that some people believe that money answers everything. There are those who believe that money... However you get it, answers everything. Solves all problems, one translation says. There are those who quickly grab Forbes magazine because they want to see who the top 100 billionaires of the world are. They want to be able to identify them by name. The same Forbes magazine also tells us who the 100, who the 100 wealthiest mobsters are. In other words, if you've gained your wealth by hook or crook, you can still get your name in Forbes magazine. There are those who watch the Kardashian shows because they're apparently wealthy people, no matter how dysfunctional they may be, and I don't even know anything about them except Lamar Odom, who's with Dallas, and that was enough for me. That's all I needed to know about them. But people just gravitate to all of these shows about all of these people who have all of this money and can't even tie their shoelaces first thing in the morning. 
because they believe that money answers everything. In James chapter 5, verse 4 and 5, it says, Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Here are some people who are holding back wages. They are keeping back rightfully earned wages from someone who has worked in their fields or in the case of Jehoiakim, in Jeremiah 22 and verse 13, Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice, who uses his neighbor's services without wages. But supposedly, if you can get by with that, and you're able to add to your bank account, that's okay. But a woe is pronounced upon covetousness, a woe is pronounced upon materialism, a woe is pronounced upon those who have enriched themselves and coveted somebody else's possessions. I have a couple of people in my congregation that I have a few rounds with about materialism and covetousness. I want you to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 20. They believe it's all right to gamble. They believe it's all right to play the lottery. They don't see anything wrong with it. And if you ever listen to Mark Davis on the radio, he'll tell you the Bible has absolutely nothing whatsoever to say about gambling or the lottery. And anybody who thinks that it does is just a biblical fool. So I'm looking at Acts chapter 20. In verse 34 and 35, and it says, You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. Now listen to what he says in verse 35. And everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus that he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. So I'm sitting across the table from somebody He's got a pot of money in front of him, and I've got a pot of money in front of me. And my goal is to be sure that his pot of money ends up with my pot of money, and he walks away with nothing. Now, just extrapolate that in reference to the lottery. You've got people putting millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars in the lottery, and the goal is that I get the $350 million and everybody else walks away with nothing. That's what I want to happen. And you tell me that's not covetousness, which Habakkuk has condemned. And Paul says the biblical scenario would be this. I'm sitting in front of my pot of money, and you're sitting in front of your pot of money, and I give you my pot of money because it's more blessed to give than to receive. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, Tell those who are rich in this present world not to trust in the uncertainty of riches but to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the future. Maybe we don't have lottery players here tonight, but maybe you know somebody who does play the lottery, and that is covetousness, and it is condemned in the Scriptures. Ezekiel 7 and verse 19 talks about those whose gold and silver became the stumbling block of their iniquity. That means that they stumbled over their gold and silver, which then led them into sin. Habakkuk also saw something else in his woes. In Habakkuk chapter 3, the, 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 this is actually the third of the woes. This, we're still in chapter 2. We did the first two combined together. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 18 and 19 says, Woe to him who says to what awake to silent stone arise. It shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. Now I realize that you and I are going to, you're going to say to me, well, preacher, we just don't have that kind of problem in the world in which we live today. Uh, the, the United States of America is not fraught with uh, idols. And so therefore... We don't really have to worry about this dumb stone or this piece of wood arising and making itself or, or, or fashioning it and, and making it into something. Here's a woe pronounced against idol worship. 
But let me ask you a question. Does this sound familiar to you? I'm going to read from Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God has made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature, have been made known and clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing to be wise and became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies should be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is God blessed forever. Amen. That sounds like us. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They did not choose to retain God in their knowledge. And they worshiped man or creatures. And what we have a problem with today is the worship of man. Habakkuk pronounced a woe upon those who say to a stone arise, to a piece of wood, teach. And yet we live in a society and culture who wants to reject God, the Creator, and wants us to worship and serve man, the creation. You see, things don't change. People don't change. Cultures don't change. The names change. The uh, ways we go about doing our business change. But you know what? If you steal somebody's ID on the Internet, that's still theft just like you stole his horse back in the 1800s, or just like you stole his pot of gold back in the 1500s. It doesn't matter. It's still theft. You hack into somebody's bank account and you steal their money, that's still theft. Thieves still exist. As I was driving today somewhere, and of course we know the, or at least you probably know something about the controversy that has arisen over Chick-fil-A and the comments made by Dan Cathy and the comments about being in favor of traditional marriage and, um, and then the homosexual community took offense at that and so they said they're going to boycott Chick-fil-A. So Rick Santorum and uh, Governor Huckabee decided this was going to be you know, a Chick-fil-A Appreciation Day and 635,000 people were supposed to go to Chick-fil-A and buy, you know, buy a product from them today. And I was listening to a lady say, well, traditional marriage, oh, there's no such thing as traditional marriage in the Bible. Marriage is all over the place. You've got people who are married. You've got Paul who hated marriage. You've got uh, David who had eight wives. You've got, and you know what? Again, professing to be wise, we become fools, don't we? Because Jesus himself took us all the way back to the beginning. He was fully aware of all that the Bible taught about all of these different, or not, I'm sorry, all that men taught about all these different configurations of marriage, even among some of the heroes of the Bible, they clearly misinterpreted and misapplied God's rules and laws concerning marriage. Jesus said from the beginning it has not been this way. He who created them in the beginning created them male and female. And what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. One man, one woman, together for life. The only exceptions, death and adultery. That's what the Bible teaches. That's traditional marriage. Not homosexual marriage, not lesbian marriage, not multiple married partners, not living with somebody until you decide that you want to get married. A lady was talking to me today. She heard something on a TV show where a couple had been dating for 30 years. Actually living together, but we'll say dating. For 30 years, and he kept asking her to marry him. They had like four or five kids. And she finally said yes after 30 years that she'd get married. You know, the problems, the woes that are pronounced by Habakkuk still exist today. We've just changed the form of worship, but we still do not like to retain God in our knowledge. We don't want to know what God has to say. 
Habakkuk had another woe. In Habakkuk 2.12, woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity. Oh, by the way, I guess you heard the other part of the controversy. Rahm Emanuel, the mayor of Chicago, said that Chick-fil-A values are not Chicago values. So therefore, we're not going to allow Chick-fil-A to build another facility in our city. In Ezekiel 22, verse 25 through 29, we see exactly how things go awry. And one of the problems that we face is that we have the same kind of leadership vac vacuum today that they had back then. There is a conspiracy of her prophets, 25 says of chapter 22, in her midst like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured lives. They've taken treasure and precious things. They've made many widows in the midst of her. That's the prophets. Her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. They've made no distinction between the holy and the profane. And they have not taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. That's the priests. Her princes within her are like wolves, tearing the prey by shedding blood and destroying lives in order to get dishonest gain. That's the princess. What kind of people do you think this kind of leadership produced? In verse 29, it says, The people of the land have practiced oppression, committed a robbery. They have wronged the poor, the needy, have oppressed the sojourner without justice. I search for a man among them, among the prophets, among the priests, among the princes, among the people, to stand in the gap. And there was no one found. I'm very fearful that if we continue on in the pathway that we have today with the leadership we have today, in religion, out of religion, in government, out of government, that one day God is going to look for someone to bridge the gap between himself and his people and there won't be anybody found. You see, when the prophets and the priests and the princes are corrupt, what do you think is going to happen to the people? When people can't read clear Bible instructions and see what the Bible teaches on moral issues, then what do you think is going to happen to our nation? What's going to happen when these ideas that if you stand up for Bible truth, that somehow that's the values of our cities. I'm sorry, you stand against Bible truth, that's the that, is, that is the values of our cities. What's going to happen to our morals? We're already seeing a lot of it happening now. Habakkuk pronounced a woe also. And Habakkuk 2, 15 and 16, Woe to you who make his neighbor drink. You pour out your wrath um, upon them. He even says in Habakkuk 2 and verse 5, Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man, who has never at rest. Uh, his, his, uh, his greed is as wide as show, like death he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations, collects as his own as all of, uh, collects, and collects as his own all peoples. I didn't do that very well, did I? I should be reprimanded. Somebody probably will. Do you think I'm going to talk about social drinking now? And I'm not. Because back because a pack of two says that wine is an arrogant man who never gets enough, and he makes fools out of all of us. And the application I want to make is that sin, whatever form it takes, makes fools out of us all. Habakkuk is just as fresh and new as the pages of your newspaper. I realize we don't have pages of newspapers anymore. Uh, if you, actually, if you buy a newspaper out of the box, you're probably archaic and arcane. Probably people are going to wonder what's wrong with you. But we still have covetousness. And sin is still making a fool out of us. And our morals and our priests and our princes and our prophets and our people are still stabbing each other in the back and destroying one another, just like in the book of Habakkuk. You see, in 1 Samuel 25 and verse 21, King Saul said, I have been a fool. I have erred exceedingly. And I played the fool, rather. 
And so sin makes a fool out of all of us. Hebrews 11, 25 and 26 talks about the passing pleasures of sin. How glorious it appears, how wonderful it appears at first. And then before you know it, before you know it, it's made a fool of us. We're ashamed, we're embarrassed. We're bowing our head and burying our head. Ashamed of ourselves, ashamed of what we said, ashamed of what we've done, ashamed of who we have hurt because sin has made a fool of us. And sometimes we think, well, kind of like, Jer- uh, uh, rather, kind of like Habakkuk, we sit there and ask ourselves a question. You say, well, you know, uh, all these things are happening in this nation and all these things are happening around us and our, our, our governmental officials seems to, seem to have abandoned moral principles and it seems like that we're uh, catering to the world and to worldliness and to uh, the forces of uh, the homosexual community or perhaps the forces of, uh, of secularism or perhaps the forces of materialism and worldly-mindedness. And we find ourselves uh, assaulted by the scientists who claim that we're nothing more than intellectual simpletons if we, uh, if we believe in creationism. And in how in the world are we ever going to be able to survive this? And Jeremiah 20 and verse 11 says the following to us, But the Lord is with me like a dread champion. Therefore my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will be utterly ashamed because they have failed. With an everlasting disgrace that will not be forgotten. Sin will make a fool of us, but God will make us successful. And those who oppose and those who are enemies are going to stumble with a disgrace that will never be forgotten. And I've got one name that I want to present to you as the poster child for this truth, the name Goliath. What do you think about Goliath when you think about him? We know how tall he was. We know how heavy he was. We know what kind of armor he, he bore. We know how he taunted the, nation, the armies of the nation of Israel. And we know how one shepherd boy was able to bring him down with a single shot from a sling Right between the eyes, Goliath is ever, forevermore disgraced because one young man believed in the power and the might and the strength of God. So in the time remaining, which is not much, I want to look at five other things real quickly that Habakkuk has to say. In Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 13, he prepares us for the crucifixion. It says, Thine eyes are too pure to behold what is evil. Thou canst not look upon evil with favor. When Jesus cried out in Matthew chapter 27, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is exactly what happened because 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 says that God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. When, when Habakkuk cried out, In wrath, remember mercy. Don't forget your people. Don't forget what you've done. In wrath, remember mercy. He had already fast-forwarded in his mind, in his heart, in his will, a plan that would make mercy possible so that Jesus Christ, it says in Acts 2 and verse 24, could not be held by the grave. It was impossible for it to hold him. He had to be resurrected. John 10 and verse 18, he said, No man takes my life from me, but I lay it down in my own initiative, that I may take it up again, this commandment, This commandment have I heard from my Father. The resurrection was a command. The resurrection was an absolute necessity because Christ committed no sin, neither was any guile found in his mouth, 1 Peter 2, 21 and 22. And so therefore when he died on the cross, because God could not look upon sin with favor and Jesus had become sin, God turned his face away. And Jesus Christ said, Why hast thou forsaken me? But once the sins had been atoned for, we read in Romans the last four, the last verse, I think it's verse 11, but don't, don't hold me to that. Just look for the last verse of Romans 4. It said, He was delivered, delivered up for our transgressions. He was raised for our justification. Because Jesus' death justified us, He was raised from the dead. 
We also see in Habakkuk 1 and verse, uh, I'm sorry, um, Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. A statement that says, Behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Now, false teachers, go to that quotation from that passage in Galatians 3 and verse 11, the just shall live by faith. They don't remember the context of Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. You see, before I can have faith, I've got to have humility. The proud man stands as his own two feet. Romans 9, verse 30 and 31 describes the difference between the Jews and the Gentiles because the Jews were pursuing righteousness based upon law totally without faith in Christ and the Gentiles were willing to pursue obedience to God with faith in Christ in the picture. You see, it's all about pride. The just shall live by faith because it is our faith that brings us to our knees to recognize our need for God. Romans 12 and verse 3 says, Let no man think more highly of himself than he ought to think. But as each has been given a measure of faith, our esteem, our self-esteem, our self-worth is defined by our relationship with God. We see that Galatians 6, or I'm sorry, 5 and verse 6, 7 and 8 says the following. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything but faith that works by love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. In other words, if someone's trying to tell you not to obey the gospel tonight, it's not God. If someone tells you that you can be justified by faith and faith only, it's not God. If somebody tells you that you can be justified by calling upon the name of Jesus Christ in prayer, by praying the sinner's prayer, it's not God. Because when Peter was asked, what shall we do? The answer was this. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, verse 38 and 39. Why didn't Peter tell them to pray the sinner's prayer? Because it wouldn't get them to heaven. It wouldn't forgive them of their sins. It would not touch the blood of Christ. That can only be done when we're immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of sins. One final thought from Habakkuk. 2 in verse 3 and 1 verse 5 and 6. God says in Habakkuk 2 and verse 3, For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. God says in my own time. God's not on our time schedule. He's not in our time frame. He's not doing things because that's the way we think it needs to be done. And when he talked about Nebuchadnezzar, he talked about the Chaldeans, and he talked about what they were going to accomplish by bringing Judea in submission for seven years of Babylonian captivity, he said, by my own means. I'm going to do it my way in my time. People are wringing their hands. Where's the promise of his coming? We've got books on top of books on top of books. Count down to Armageddon. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus Christ left this earth. It's got to be time for Jesus to come again. But Deuteronomy 7 and verse 9, it says, God keeps mercy to a thousand generations. Now, maybe that's hyperbole. Maybe it's exaggeration. But to me, that means that in the mind of God, the earth could last a thousand generations. You know how long that is? That is 40,000 years. God's not on our time schedule. He's not in our time frame. He's not doing things the way we think they ought to be done. In the time that we allotted for it to be done in. But he has promised that we will be victorious. Habakkuk, in chapter 3, we didn't get to chapter 3, saw God bringing his wrath and his vengeance upon the nation of uh, uh, Babylon because of their actions toward Judea. So I want to close with the final words of Habakkuk. In Habakkuk 3 and verse 17, it says, Though the fig tree should not blossom... And there be no fruit on the vines. 
Though the yield of the olive tree shall fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls. You talk about a pretty desperate economic situation. I don't think our economic situation today is anything like that. But he does say this, Yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like hinds feet, and he makes me walk in the high places. If you need to respond to the invitation, will you come while we stand and sing?